No one wants to be flawed, yet everyone is. Fortunately, the Bible doesn't shy away from the stories of flawed individuals and how those weaknesses affected their lives, their relationships with others, and their futures. Today, we're going to be talking about Peter. And sure, we think of him as the saint that built the church, but Peter, like all of us, was sometimes too quick to speak and act. Let's see what we can learn from our own lives from the story of Peter. Have you noticed how often Jesus conveyed truth through parables? Rather than just come right out and say things, he used stories that required thinking. Even in his small interactions with random people, he spoke in what seemed like riddles that needed to be pondered and worked out. Sometimes people understood him immediately, but generally people were left with questions and the disciples were among those. Don't worry, we aren't going to be pondering a lot of parables today. But I wanted to highlight how his use of parables tells us something important about Jesus. Obviously, Jesus wanted us to think. He didn't want us just to believe things because we've been told that's what we're supposed to believe. He didn't want the people of his time to blindly follow the religious leaders, nor to do things just because that was the way they had always done them. Jesus challenged people to look at God and faith in new ways. In fact, as Methodists, one of the things that we believe God has given us to help us build our faith and understanding of who God is is our reason and critical thinking. I'm telling you all this so that you understand Peter even more clearly. Jesus wanted people to think, understand, and then act. But time and again, we see Peter do the opposite. Now, don't get me wrong. A willingness to jump in with both feet was certainly necessary for someone to drop everything and follow Jesus the way Peter did. If Peter had hemmed and hauled when Jesus invited him to leave behind what he knew in order to follow him, our Bible and our faith would look very different. Still, there were times that Peter's tendency to be impetuous or move quickly without thinking got him into trouble. Let's start with the story of how Peter got his name. You see, originally Peter was actually named Simon. And sometimes you'll see him named as Simon Peter in the New Testament. Peter means rock, and it is a name that Jesus gave him. He said, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus replied, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because no human has shown this to you. Rather, my father who was in heaven has shown you. I tell you that you are Peter and I'll build my church on this rock. The gates of the underworld won't be able to stand against it. So far, so good, right? Jesus asked a question and Peter knew the answer. So why am I picking on poor Peter about not thinking? Well, let's continue with the story and see just how quickly Peter goes from doing great to getting it horribly wrong. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that can make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. And just like that, Peter goes from the stone to build the church on to a potential stumbling block for Jesus. You see, Peter couldn't imagine the Son of God suffering and being killed. Surely that's not the way God would want this to play out, right? And maybe Peter even protested because he thought there was no way he would let that happen, that he would stop anyone who tried to hurt his rabbi. In fact, we read in the Gospel of John that when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter takes out a sword and cuts someone's ear off. Peter was responding out of emotion without thinking through the fact that he was forcefully trying to correct the Son of God or that God isn't bound by human expectations. Surely we wouldn't make that same mistake if we were Peter, especially not after just having declared our belief that Jesus was the son of God and being given the honor of being named the rock on which the church would be built, right? We'd certainly like to believe that, but 
take a minute to think about how many times you've done that same kind of thing. When have you doubted God because something bad has happened or thought that bad things should never happen to good people? We're using our own limited understanding to try to make sense of what our infinitely awesome God is doing, and it doesn't work. Sometimes we can get a glimpse of the truth, but often we just come away with the wrong idea. But being able to recognize that flaw in ourselves is a strength that Peter didn't have. Let's see what Peter does next. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Here we see Peter using his own understanding and emotions to react to a situation. He has seen Jesus be transfigured and have a conversation with Moses and Elijah. I think it's safe to say we'd all be a little stumped as to what to do in this situation, but I really love Peter's response to build dwelling places for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It's like Peter wants them all to live happily ever after together on top of that mountain and forget all about the world, the things Jesus is supposed to do, and the things that Jesus has told him have to happen. To me, this feels a lot like the way we try to bargain with God. Have you ever promised God that if only God will make this one thing happen or not happen, you'll be good forever? We never take into account that not only are we human and thus certain to mess up again, but that God's plans are far greater than our own. We aren't thinking beyond the moment and our emotions when we respond like that, just like Peter. Then we come to the time leading up to the crucifixion and see that Peter still can't help himself. When Jesus tells him that they'll all desert him, Peter immediately argues that everyone else might leave him, but he won't. Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him three times that night before the rooster crows. Again, Peter argues that even if he has to die with Jesus, he won't deny him. Then Jesus gets arrested and all the disciples, including Peter, run away. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. A servant woman came and said to him, you were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of all of them saying, I don't know what you were talking about. When we went over to the gate, another woman saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. With a solemn pledge, he denied it again saying, I don't know the man. A short time later, those standing there came and said to Peter, you must be one of them. The way you talk gives you away. Then he cursed and swore, I don't know the man. At that very moment, the rooster crowed. Peter remembered Jesus' words, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and cried uncontrollably. The level of fear and confusion that Peter must have felt in that moment had to have been overwhelming. None of this was the way that anyone outside of Jesus thought that the Messiah's coming and triumph would look like for the world. People expected an overthrow of the government or a military coup. The disciples expected a religious victory, and Peter thought he would be by Jesus' side through it all. So why did Peter still deny Jesus three times, even after Jesus warned him about it, and he swore it wouldn't happen? Because he was human and afraid. I think we would all be hard-pressed to react differently in the face of the realization that Peter was coming to grips with, that Jesus was really going to die, and that following him might mean that Peter would die too. So Peter chose to protect himself from the religious authorities that were going to kill his teacher and friend by denying that he even knew Jesus. Even if you had trouble relating to Peter's earlier impetuous reactions, this one should make complete and total sense to you. All the promises of redemption that Jesus offered were still true. They were just coming about in a way that didn't make sense to Peter or the other disciples. We are all guilty of wanting God to act in a way that makes sense to us for God's plans to fit our plans and understanding. When that doesn't happen, which is often the case, we can react out of the emotions stirred up in us. 
Our confusion and fear, our doubt and discomfort are natural, but we need to take the time to stop and think. Just like Jesus challenged people to think throughout his ministry, we are still challenged today to take a beat and think about what we are seeing and experiencing. When we react impulsively, we tend to mess things up like Peter. But when we think about what God is doing and how our understanding pales in comparison to that, we can respond in a more helpful way. Thankfully, we can look to Peter to see that it is possible to change. Peter grows and lives into the name Jesus gave him. Throughout Acts, we see his patience and willingness to let the Holy Spirit guide him. He grows more patient, listening for what God tells him to do. His obedience grows as his impetuousness decreases. He cautions other believers to think, to be patient, and to respond out of that thoughtfulness. Therefore, once you have your minds ready for action and you are thinking clearly, place your hope completely on the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So how can we be more like the older, wiser Peter that we see later in the New Testament and less like the impetuous version of Peter we see in the Gospels? First, we have to stop and think. Rather than reacting on impulse out of our emotions, we should think about the situation and what God might be doing. That makes it possible for us to respond in a thoughtful way that can help rather than harm. Second, we need to recognize that our understanding is nothing compared to God's. God isn't bound by our expectations and our ideas of how the world is supposed to work. When we can recognize and confess our shortcomings to God, we can start to move towards accepting that even when we don't understand the way God might be moving, we can trust that God will work in ways that lead to good. I challenge you this week to look at the way you respond and react to situations. Are you letting your emotions drive you or are you taking the time to think through what is happening and where God might be in the midst of the situation? Are you relying only on your own understanding or are you trying to recognize that God acts in unexpected ways? Thank you.